Shalom, my friends. Welcome to this video where we are going to debunk Jews for Jesus, Jeff Morgan, on his attempt to convert a Jew, an Israeli Jew, to Christianity by way of the typical smokescreen contextual abuse of the Tanakh, such as Isaiah 53. You know the whole deal. Let's get into the video. Name of Jesus? Yeah, of course. Have you ever seen Isaiah 53? Does it sound like anybody in history that uh, comes to mind? Yeah, like uh, Jesus. <laughs> Interesting, right? So really that could apply to really anyone in history. Um, describing such vague ideas, none of the, those ideas, even though society attributes them to Jesus, did Jesus really do any of those things when you really think about it? No, and we'll revisit that when it comes up again. Happened to you and your arm. My dad got hit by two missiles of Hezbollah in the north side of the country, and they uh, penetrated the tent. So you've been going through a Shikum, a therapy process, a rehabilitation? For the past uh, almost uh, four months. Four months? Wow. My injury was at the October, October 15th. And how are you feeling today? Uh, way better. Really? Way better. Yeah. There's still a lot of stuff going on, physically and emotionally, but uh, the fact that I have my arm and my leg and I didn't lose them. So did that, did that experience get you thinking a lot about life? Death. So this is an extremely common missionary tactic, right? What's going to happen when you die, right? It's a fear-mongering tactic that Christians will use on really anyone. They, you know, of course they use it on Jews as well, but it's like Christian missionary evangel, you know, evangelism 101 is like, get them afraid about death because the Christians ultimately afraid about death themselves. So they want to put that on they're, you know, when they witness, when they try to evangelize to, to people, or Jews, they will try and put on this fear of the unknown, right? And basically try to convince you based on the fear of what's going to happen when you die. And then they will, of course, arrogantly and ignorantly claim that they know where they're going when they die. Of course, they don't. Um, nobody knows but God, Right when Christians go around saying that they know definitively where they're going to go when they die, who are you to say that? How can you be so arrogant to say that you know definitively where you're going to go when you die because you believe that Jesus died for your sins when the Tanakh doesn't give any indication that that's the only way to go to heaven. But then they also have the arrogance to say that they know for a fact that somebody who doesn't believe the way that they do are going to go to hell. You see, there's no biblical basis for anything that they're saying, and it's just a complete fear-mongering tactic. Yeah, of course. Makes you think to <laughs> about uh, a lot of uh, stuff. Yeah. And in the first uh, few days, I couldn't really sleep uh, very well. Not because I had nightmares, but because I had so much to think about. How lucky in so many aspects I was. To still be alive? Yeah. Do you think that it's luck or do you think that uh, God has anything to do with it? Um, I'm not sure <laughs> what I believe in. For some reason, I set uh, a few centimeters to the right in my chair, which uh, if it was a few centimeters to the left, I would have uh, not be here yeah. today. I don't know if it's just luck or if it's something uh, on the outside. Yeah. But I am uh, really grateful for my crew and uh, my brain that uh, fun functioned really well in that situation and uh, to rescue myself and all the others that got uh, hit. Wow. Well, I'm glad you're here. I mean, it's a touching story. Um, but unfortunately, Jeff Morgan here uh, of Jews for Jesus, he likes to prey on, you know, people that might appear to be in vulnerable situations as he might see it. Because a lot of these people, you know, it's very easy to connect to the concept of Christianity if you're in a vulnerable situation. What? Some guy died for my sins? What? I'm forgiven? All I have to do is believe that he's my Lord and Savior, Chaz I mean, 
it's a very enticing idea to somebody in a desperate situation, right? Oh man, what a deal. But in reality, if you actually have knowledge of the Tanakh, right, this is why you typically don't see Jeff Morgan going up to a religious Jew on the street asking these questions in Israel, right? He's going up to people that are less religious, that don't have a lot of knowledge about the Tanakh, about Judaism, and he wants to, you know, occasionally he'll, you know, get in a conversation with, you know, Jews who know their stuff to, a, you know, a greater degree, but he's not going to make a lot of progress with those types of people because they actually know the Tanakh. But somebody like this guy, you know, who's less familiar with the Tanakh and, and more secular, and especially since he went through a traumatic situation, you know, it's a lot, he has a better chance of getting this into, you know, basically preying on the ignorance and vulnerability of this individual. So it's it's really, really disgusting when you think about it, but that's the way they operate. And that's why I have this channel to combat the predatory nature of missionaries and uh, to show the, the truth that Jesus is not the Messiah. Jesus is not God. And uh, the Tanakh is true. And to follow the ways of Hazal and to follow the Torah. Are you feeling okay right now? I'm feeling great. Oh, good. Good. I'm glad to hear that. So when you were younger in Israel, you, you learn the Tanakh. Yeah. You yeah. study it every year in school. Yeah, it wasn't so long ago until I graduated high school. Yeah. A bit. So do you remember anything from it? Yeah, of course. It's uh, something uh, very basic about uh, yeah. being a Jew, whether you believe it or not. Right, right. Do you know what the Tachlit uh, Torah, like the purpose for the, the Torah is? I believe it's uh, some sort of uh, guidance that the Jewish people had. So just to clarify, pretty much in Israel, they learn the Tanakh, but they don't necessarily learn it in an in-depth way or from, you know, even like a religious... They learn it from a religious perspective, but not necessarily from a perspective of everybody really believes. It's, it's a, you know, because Israel, there are a lot of religious Jews there, but there are also a lot of secular Jews there. So there is somewhat of an emphasis on, you know, Jewish learning, of course, but uh, not everyone really necessarily believes, unfortunately. So that's where my work comes into play or, you know, just my hobby more so. <laughs> um, but yeah, obviously I want to be able to influence as many people as I can to follow the Torah. So please share, subscribe, like, and that would be awesome if you guys could do that just so that we can share this message so that the message of falsehood of Christianity does not spread to places where it infiltrates the young and ignorant minds of people uh, like this individual here and uh, that the blind, you know, blind Jews who follow Jesus won't lead other blind Jews who might be less knowledgeable about what Judaism believes down this path of falsehood and belief in Jesus. Many years ago and it's still uh, proceeding today. Yeah. Do you think that uh, the Tanakh uh, is meant to um, bring people to the knowledge of, of God or just give like life principles? Uh, I believe uh, every man sees uh, the Tanakh uh, a bit differently, mm -hmm. even those who believe and those who... Right. But uh, it really has uh, some pr basic principles that uh, we can rely on. In ancient times, I believe it was uh, even more important to have some uh, guidance when there was no uh, law. So before the law of Moses, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. You ever heard about the name of Jesus? Yeah, of course. What do you know about him? Uh, he was born in Bethlehem. Mm. Uh, in his, and he was Jewish his, uh, for his entire uh, life, actually. Yeah. yeah. Or the Christian, uh, it was made after, uh, only after he died. Mm. Did you know that uh, in the book, in the Tanakh, there's the prophet Micah. In Micah 5, verse okay. 2, in the Tanakh, there's a prophecy about the Messiah coming from Bethlehem. Yeah, I'll show it to you in Hebrew. Oh, okay. okay. Yeshua, Jesus, was born in uh, Bethlehem. So, so this is, and I haven't really covered this prophecy in depth on my channel because it's kind of a nothing burger, meaning it just really doesn't go anywhere because just like 
virtually all prophecies that Christians bring up. This prophecy isn't exclusive to the Messiah, right? It says, and you now, Beit Lechem, it says, Beit Lechem, Ephrata, right? Bethlehem, Ephrata, whatever, you know, however you want to transliterate that. You should have been the lowest of the clans of Judah from you. He shall emerge from me to be a ruler over Israel, and his origin is from old, from days of yore, right? So it says, and you, Bethlehem, it says, whence David emanated, as it is stated in 1 Samuel 17, 58, it says, the son of your bondsman Jesse, the Bethlehem, Bethlehemite, right? So King David was also born in Bethlehem. And that's what this is referring to, is the idea of King David, who is the prototype for the Messiah. That's where this the whole Davidic co covenant came from, right? When you think about... David was living with, you know, uh, Jesse, right, Yeshai, when he was anointed, right? And that was sort of this idea that, like, it wasn't, he was like the least of the clans of Judah in the sense that, like, he, he wasn't really assumed that he was going to be great, right? Even in the story of Samuel, when you see David's anointing, he was the last of the sons that was chosen amongst all of Jesse's sons. So like, that's where this is going from. And it says, you should have been lowest of the clans of Judy because of the stigma of Ruth the Moabitess. And then it also, right, the Christians get all excited about how there's, you know, there's also a connection to the Messiah. Well, of course there's a connection to the Messiah. Like, my entire channel goes into detail about how the majority of the prophecies that we say are about the Messiah, right, including this one, aren't exclusive to the Messiah, son of David, and no one else, right? Because this is speaking about King David in the most immediate context. It also has future fulfillment in the Messiah simply because of the fact that King David was born in Bethlehem. Not that the Messiah must specifically be born in Bethlehem. That's a misnomer. There's no necessity for that. It's simply that King David was born in Bethlehem and his the future Messiah will be born from David. It's simple as that. So the New Testament is just contextually abusing this idea and saying that it is exclusive to the Messiah and that the Messiah had to be born in Bethlehem. Silliness. That's not what Micah 5 is saying. Anyway, moving on. Some people say that like the Messiah is... is no, it was a prophecy. Ah, it's, it's not, yeah, it's a messianic prophecy. So he said, it doesn't know that it's a prophecy. Yeah, so that's what he meant. Like, And I go over in my channel, ex I, I talk about how to identify prophecies that are exclusively speaking about the Messiah, Son of David, and no one else. It's right here. It's in this video here. Probably one of the most important videos on my channel. Please watch it. It's only 20 minutes long. It's called, What is Messianic Prophecy? Differentiating between the generic and the specific David, their king. Please give that a watch if you watch anything on my channel um, because it goes into detail about how to identify prophecies that are specific to the Messiah, Son of David, and no one else versus prophecies that have generic reference to the Messiah that is not specific only to the Messiah. So that would be, for example, Micah 5, which Christians contextually abuse to say is only about the Messiah. And we're going to get into a few other examples of this as this video continues. So... Stay tuned. Well, there's other prophecies like um, Isaiah Nun Gimel. Have you ever seen uh, Isaiah Nun Gimel? Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, there it is. So immediately, right, we have this reference to Isaiah 53. Perfect example. Isaiah 53 is not exclusive to the Messiah either. I've done entire videos about this, right? It's, of course, speaking more generically about Israel. Now, once again, there is nowhere in the entirety of the servant songs where the servant is referred to as a king or of David. And if we're going specifically with what was mentioned before about Micah 5, for example, there is no reference of the servant of Isaiah 53 or anywhere else in the servant songs where the servant is mentioned of being having origins in Bethlehem. So <laughs> they don't really have a consistent standard of how to identify prophecies that are exclusive to the Messiah, son of David, and no one else. They just don't. That's the problem with Christianity that you see recurring over and over and over again in the New Testament. I might know the story, but I don't uh, know uh, where exactly in the 
Yeah, that's not gonna happen. Yeah, I want you to read something for me. You don't mind? No, I don't mind. Okay, cool. You may tell you how to read the Quran, and who do you think it sounds like? Okay. Who is the one 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 who is the so now he's just reading it in Hebrew. One thing that I wanted to emphasize here is this idea of who was the arm of the Lord revealed to. And, um, you know, this first verse here, a lot of Christians will say that the arm of the Lord is being revealed only to Israel because Israel is a bunch of bumbling idiots that, you know, can't identify the Messiah or whatever. But when you actually look at Isaiah 52 in context with Isaiah 53, God actually says here, the Lord has revealed his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. All the nations. Kol ha-goyim. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. So when you look at Isaiah 53 and you look at the context of, you know, especially here where it says that many nations, right? It says goyim rabim, right? Not just Israel. It's talking about the plurality of nations, of the kings who will shut their mouths because of him, because of the servant, right? Not just Israel. Then we look at the context of Isaiah 53. Who would have believed our report and to whom was the arm of the Lord revealed? Not just to Israel. It's revealed before the eyes of all the nations, God's holy arm, so that the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. So once again, Christianity contextually abuses this, assumes that only Israel is, you know, the, the only group of people that are being surprised or shocked by the idea of the revelation of the servant of Isaiah 53. Clearly not. No, the entire world is going to be shocked by this. And Israel is going to be saved if you actually look. And we'll get into that as the video continues. Keep watching. נחמדהו, נבזה וחדל אישים, איש מחרבות, וידוע חולי כמסתר פנים, ממנו נבזה ולא חש השבנו. אכן חלינו נשא ומחובנו סבלם, ואנחנו חשבנו נגוע מוקל. והוא מחולל נפסענו, מדוכא מעונותינו, מוסר שלומנו עליו ובעבורתו, נרפא לנו, כולנו כצאן טעינו, איש לדרכו פוננו, ואדוני יפגיע בו. את עוון כולנו, ניגש והוא נענה ולא יפתח פיו, כסה לטבח, יובל הוא כרחל לפני גזוזיה, נעלמה ולא יפתח פיו. מעוצר ומשפט, לוקח ואת דורו, מי ישוחח כי נגזר מארץ חיים, מפשע, אמין הגל עמו. ויתן את רשעים קברו ואת עשיר במותה, ולא חמאס עשה ולא מרמה בפיו, ואדוני חפץ דקאו אכלי. You see, they like to have them read the entire chapter in isolation, right? Which is just a clear example of contextual abuse, right? When would, it, it, it's just rampantly used in this way. And I think that should be, you know, the smoking gun as to what's happening here, that they are contextually abusing scripture as we've just demonstrated with Isaiah 52. But it gets worse as far as the contextual abuse, believe it or not. Does it sound like anybody in history that uh, comes to mind? Yeah, like uh, Jesus. Yeah. So yeah, he had him read the entire chapter, and the only reason why it sounds like Jesus is because the Christians attribute those things to Jesus. Not because Jesus actually physically healed anybody, according to the reality of today, right? People claim through this sort of collective consciousness of, you know, the idea of the lore of Jesus and what the idea of healing represents, right? You'll hear this idea from Dr. Michael Brown and a lot of people and they'll say, oh, Jesus healed me. You could attribute 
quote unquote healing to anything. It's called the placebo effect, right? Somebody could say Muhammad healed them. Somebody could say a golden calf healed them. Somebody could say Vishnu healed them. Joseph Smith healed them. It doesn't matter, right? You can make up this idea that you were saved by something without having any sort of tangible idea of what that is, or you can attribute anthropomorphic features to something and claim that that quote unquote healed you because it gave you this, you know, energy or some, you know, sort of reversal of your depression or whatever you want to call it, right? So it's this intangible poltergeist of whatever you want to call it. And because society has settled on the idea of Jesus, once again, it's a very instant gratification concept, Christianity. It's like almost like a drug when you think about it. The concept is kind of evil brilliance, right? Your sins are forgiven without you doing anything, right? It sounds like some selfless act when in reality it's like, what is it even, how is it selfless if this is God incarnate and it's impossible to kill God? So what does it even matter? Like the whole thing is just completely backwards, right? I've done entire videos on the hypocrisy and just absolute backwards logic of the idea of Jesus dying on the cross. I did entire debates about this with Radar Apologetics, uh, with this uh, man who claims to be a Messianic rabbi, uh, Eduardo, um, where I debated about the idea of whether or not Jesus' blood is required for our forgiveness of sins today. And clearly it's not. Um, you can watch that video. And I also did, If you, this is a shorter version of that. It's basically all the arguments that I give in the debate the best way to debunk the New Testament blood sacrifice is not the only way to atone for sin. It's very clear. There are other ways of dealing with sin other than blood sacrifice. And Jesus' blood is never prescribed in the Tanakh as the only way to atone for sin in any way, shape, or form. Right? So why are you peddling this false narrative to Jews? Jeff Morgan, Jews for Jesus, Dr. Michael Brown, all of you... Jews who should know better, you claim you know the Tanakh so well, yet you miss the core message. You worship literally a man-god, and you believe that his blood is the only way to atone for sins, provided that you believe in him. I mean, you're just inventing nonsense that has no scriptural basis in the Tanakh. Anyway. Yeah, and so this is in uh, this is in our Tanakh, really, and this is a definitely a prophecy. It's definitely a messianic prophecy, and many rabbis throughout the his, throughout history considered the person in here Melech Hamashiach. They didn't say Jesus, but they said Melech Hamashiach. So once again, this is complete contextual abuse of rabbinic literature, right? Of course, we know the New Testament authors contextually abuse the, abuse the Tanakh, but the evangelists take it a step further today and contextually abuse the Talmud. Once again, there is no problem with Isaiah 53 having a collective, you know, idea of Israel and then also having the Messiah being inclusive of that servant, right? When you talk about the servant of Isaiah 53. But to say only the Messiah is referred to here, even according to the rabbis, they understand that it refers not just to the Messiah, but also to the collective, at least the righteous among Israel. And I give examples in my you know, debates against Dr. Michael Brown on this, where I speak concerning the remnant, especially Isaiah, right? According to Dr. Michael Brown and the Christian concept of the servant songs, the servant is either a dumb, deaf, blind, idiot servant, or the servant is some sort of sinless God servant. But where does that leave Isaiah, right? Because the dumb, deaf, blind, lying, idiot servant, how can you trust that servant? How can you trust the words of Isaiah if Isaiah is just as dumb, deaf, blind, and lying as any other person? Because that's the false dichotomy that Christianity creates when you assume that Isaiah 53 can only refer to the supposed sinless Messiah who they claim is Jesus. Where does that put Isaiah? Where does that put Jeremiah? Dumb, deaf, lying, idiot prophets. Chas v'shalom. That's not, they were holy people. They were part of the remnant of Israel that spoke truth. You see the problem that Christianity creates by exclusively defining the servant of Isaiah 53 as only referring to Jesus.
Why follow any prophet? You can't trust their words then. And there's many prophecies in our Tanakh that point us toward a savior, a Messiah. Yeah. And many Jewish people are still waiting for him to come. I believe that he's already come. So a lot of Jewish people, a lot of religious Jews, they'll say there's two Messiahs and each comes once. And my faith, the Christian faith or the Messianic Jewish faith, believe that there's one Messiah that comes twice. So this is once again, contextual abuse of rabbinic literature, right? This concept of Messiah, son of David, coming at the end of days, right, is rampant throughout scripture. Once again, I did an enti entire video explaining that here with the mess differentiating between the generic and the specific regarding messianic prophecy. And these are prophecies that Jews and Christians both agree refer exclusively to the Messiah, son of David, and no one else. I, I went on Dr. Brown's show and discussed these couple of these prophecies, Hosea 3, 5 and Ezekiel 37, verse 24, where even he agreed that these prophecies that refer to a Davidic king who will rule at the end of days, they only refer to the Messiah, son of David, and no one else. And they don't give us any indication that this Davidic king must come twice. In fact, it implies the exact opposite. And I'll go to Hosea 3, verse 5, just to show you the context of what's actually happening here and how it contradicts what he just said. Uh, Jeff Morgan, what he just said here in this video. It says, For the children of Israel shall remain for many days, having neither king, nor prince, nor sacrifice, nor pillar, nor a foe, nor teraphim. And afterwards, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness at the end of days. This prophecy says it all because it shows the timeline of the coming of the Messiah, who is also known as David their king. Even Christians agree with this. And it demonstrates that this Davidic king will not need to come before the destruction of the second temple, but rather that the Messiah, David their king, will come at the end of days, and that before this period in time, the Israel will not have a king and we will not have a sacrifice nor prince, right? The Christians say the opposite. They say, well, Jesus is your king. Jesus is your sacrifice. Well, that would contradict what it says here. And they also claim that Jesus is your God. Yet David, their king, is mentioned separate from the Lord, their God, in this clear messianic prophecy. So everything about what Jeff Morgan in the Christian position states, you know, the Jews for Jesus platform or Dr. Michael Brown is contradicted right here by this clear messianic prophecy that even Dr. Michael Brown agrees when it says David their king here refers exclusively to the Messiah, son of David and no one else, right? I confronted him about that in this video here um, where I debunked Dr. Brown live on his li own Line of Fire radio show. So give that a watch uh, regarding the House of David and how it relates to the Messiah. Anyway, moving on. One that comes to suffer and die for our sins so that we can be forgiven and reconnected with God. The other time that he comes is to, to bring judgment and rule and reign as king. So first suffering servant and then ruling king. And that's what we have, that's what we put our faith and our trust in because myself and my colleague over here, we've had personal experiences with Yeshua, with Jesus, that changed our lives completely. You know, my colleague was a, was a drug addict, prostitute on the streets, thief. I was uh, depressed and anxious and suicidal. And we had experiences that were related to Jesus. We're Jewish. We're thinking, what is... Th so once again, it's the same sob story for every single one of them, right? I mean... Not to minimize, you know, of course, somebody can be depressed and, and, you know, have a different path than believe in Jesus and they can actually find, you know, true meaning in their life through Torah and Judaism. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that the prevailing narrative is that somebody in a very vulnerable position is going to fall victim to something like Christianity, which is a very instant gratification sort of, you know, idea within its theology that all of your sins are forgiven and you really don't have to do much right? Maybe get a baptism, you know, declare your faith. But it's not like in Judaism where you develop a true Torah relationship with God through mitzvot, through putting on tefillin, through, you know, saying tefillot, through, you know, celebrating the holidays together and 
you know, keeping kosher and doing all these sorts of things that really develop a relationship with God according to what it actually says in the Torah, instead of looking at the New Testament's perspective and the Christian perspective of just saying, oh, all of that was just a bunch of nonsense that was just supposed to teach you that no matter how hard you try, you can't fulfill what God says. Even though in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 10 through 14, it says the opposite and that you can fulfill the Torah that you can do the mitzvah and you don't need Jesus to die for your sins on a cross in order for you to connect with God, right? Silliness. This Jesus, and all of a sudden he turned our lives around and, and made us clean from our worst habits, made us clean from our sins and brought us back to connection with God. And we decided to study our faith and realize that it's all in our Tanakh. It's like actually Jewish to put your faith in Jesus. It's a Jewish thing. And this is a weird trope that goes around. It's a Jewish thing. I mean, it's Jewish to, you know, Karl Marx was Jewish. It's a Jewish thing, right? You know, Bar Kochba was Jewish. It's a Jewish thing. Shabbat Tzvi was Jewish. It's a Jewish thing. Like, you can quote false messiahs throughout history and claim they were Jewish. That doesn't mean it's true, right? That's the silliness of it. Just because you claim that something is Jewish does not mean that it is consistent with what the Tanakh states, with what, you know, the Torah teaches. So, yeah, it's a very deceptive and sort of sneaky way of trying to present, you know, basically put lipstick on a pig. It's still a pig. Like, <laughs> don't be fooled. Like, Jesus came for the Jewish people and also for the rest of the world, the Gentiles. In, in Isaiah 49, it talks about how the Messiah will be a light to the nations. Ola goin. All right. Now we're going full on lie, right? There's no way around this. This guy knows better. I've done entire videos on this. It said, this is Isaiah 49. It says, he said to me, you are my servant Israel about whom I will boast. Now he's talking about this line where it says you're going to be an Ola goin. But the context of the servant isn't saying you are my servant, the Messiah, son of David, only about whom I will boast. What does it actually say? It says, you're my servant, Israel, about whom I will boast, right? And then it talks about, it says, I toiled in vain. I consumed for strength for naught and vanity. And surely my right is with the Lord and my deed is with my God. And now said the Lord who formed me in the womb as a servant to him. So the servant is still being spoken of, which is Israel, as we just read two verses ago said to bring Jacob back to him and Israel shall be gathered to him and I will be honored in the eyes of the Lord and my God was my strength and he said it is too light for you to be my servant to establish the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the besieged of Israel but I will make you a light of nations or Lagoyim so that my salvation shall be until the end of the earth. Now this is not referring exclusively to the Messiah, son of David, and no one else, because it literally says, you are my servant, Israel. Israel is not secret code word for Jesus. I'm sorry, Christians, it's not. There is nowhere in the Tanakh where the word Israel is used to exclusively refer to the Messiah, son of David, and no one else, and this is not the sole exception. If you can show me anywhere else, this is my challenge to Christians, and I made this exact same challenge in this video, refuting Dr. Brown on Isaiah 53, the servant is Israel. Show me anywhere. All Christians, show me anywhere in the Tanakh other than your erroneous understanding of Isaiah 49.3 where the word Israel is used to exclusively refer to the Messiah, son of David, and no one else. If you can do that, I will believe in your false Messiah, pagan man God called Jesus. If not, then you will have to recognize scripture for what it is. It says the servant is Israel, not exclusively the Messiah, son of David. Like I said earlier, there is nowhere in the servant songs where the servant is described as a Davidic king. I Actually, I can't remember if I mentioned that before, but I've certainly mentioned it in other videos. But that's something that is very not evident, right? That this servant would be referring only to the Messiah, son of David. So, yes, does the Messiah... Is the Messiah inclusive of Israel, the servant here? Absolutely. But to claim that the Messiah is the only one being spoken of in Isaiah 49.3, that is just complete nonsense, right? 
Now, the idea that there is a remnant among Israel that is going to bring back the rest of Israel, for example, Isaiah is speaking here, right? He is the one who is being called. So if Isaiah is being given this message, then he is primarily, for example, in this context, going to be the one who is going to bring back the besieged of Israel. So that is how Israel brings back Israel, which is a common, you know, a pathetic attempt by Christians to try and argue, well, it can't be about anyone but Jesus, because how does Israel bring back Israel? It's an old, tired, silly argument, right? Once again, why do you trust Isaiah if he's just a dumb, lying, ignorant servant, right? Just like everyone else. If Isaiah is no different from any other sinner on the planet, right? And he has no status as being righteous in any way, shape, or form, right? Then why do you listen to his words? Why do you listen to Jeremiah's words? Why do you listen to them as prophets if, if they're just as much as, you know, a sinner and not trustworthy in any way, shape, or form as anyone else? You have to make a distinction, and that's why God makes that distinction for you and shows you who the remnant of Israel is. At the very least, it's the prophets, right? So we listen to the prophets. They are are the servant mentioned here when it says you are my servant Israel and then we follow those prophets and that is how ultimately then Israel is restored and then the fully restored Israel will be the light to the nations in the future messianic age and then the arm of the Lord you know through the salvation of God when God saves Israel we will serve as that light to the nations and then the world will be shocked to know the nations of the world, for example, in Isaiah 52, when it says the kings will be shocked. It doesn't say only Israel will be shocked. It says the kings will shut their mouths, the Gentile kings, the goyim, goyim rabim. And then in the next verse, it says, who would have believed our report and to whom was the arm of the Lord revealed? Not Israel is the only one being revealed. It's being revealed in the eyes of all the nations, Isaiah 52, 10. So there you go. Isaiah 53, the servant is not referring exclusively to the Messiah. And Isaiah 49, 3 proves it. Yet, this deceiver, Jeff Morgan, would try to convince you otherwise. Very sneaky, very deceitful, but we know better. Because we know the Tanakh and we know that Isaiah 49, 3 does not state that Israel is secret code word for Jesus done plenty of videos on this please give them a watch this one and then i also did one here i did one here refuting dr brown on he has the same perspective on this and, and dr M michael brown also admits that isaiah 49 3 is the same servant as the servant of isaiah 53 which is israel there's no way around that and you know that there's millions and millions of christians and billions throughout history that have worshipped the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because of Jesus. No, they worship Jesus, who Abraham, Isaac, and and uh, Jacob did not worship Jesus, right? They worshipped the God of Israel, but they did not worship Jesus. There's no evidence in the Tanakh to say that they worship Jesus. I've done videos explaining, you know, the whole angel of the Lord thing, the great Jesus angel hunt. Jesus does not get exclusive dibs on the, you know, every anonymous angel in the Tanakh. That's not even accurate according to the New Testament. So drop that nonsense. You have no scriptural basis for that. Just recognize the fact that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did not worship Jesus. There was no contextual evidence from the Tanakh to demonstrate that in any way, shape, or form, because they didn't worship Jesus. They worshiped Hashem. They worshiped the God of Israel. And so we like to introduce people to Jesus because we don't want our Jewish people to miss him. We want to give our Jewish people the opportunity to know him, who he really is. You know, Islam will say one thing, Buddha will say another thing, the religious Jews will say another thing about who he is, but everybody's talking about Jesus. He's in the middle of it all. You know, and it's all uh, the same. It's not all the same, like it's, they're all pointing towards the same person. Like yeah. Jesus is a figure of, uh, is a topic of conversation in 
in all of the main world religions. Right. It's a test from God, right? That we wouldn't fall for that, you know, falsehood as it explicitly states in Deuteronomy chapter 13, right? It says that even if a prophet does miracles or whatever, you know, like it doesn't matter if they do miracles or they raise themselves from the dead or whatever. It doesn't say that, you know, if someone raises themselves from the dead, that means that he's the Messiah, right? This is complete circular reasoning, painting the target around the arrow, saying bullseye. No scriptural evidence for that. So why are you going around peddling this false idea that because you're stringing together Micah 5 and Isaiah 53 and they don't have any standard. That's the point. Christians have zero standard for determining what Messianic prophecy refers to specifically as far as the individual of the Messiah. They're literally just, you know, monkeys on typewriters. <laughs> That's what it amounts to. There's no standard. Yeah. Why him? I believe it's because God is trying to point everyone towards him and to see him. Who is he really? And so, have you ever read the New Testament? No, actually, no. Yeah? Have you ever thought about it? Yeah, yeah it comes up uh, in some chat with, chats with uh, other people. Yeah. Would you mind if I gave you one in English or Hebrew? That you can check it out and know what we're talking about? Uh, yeah, sure. What would you like, English or Hebrew? English. English? Here's one. And you open it up and it says the genealogy of Yeshua the Messiah. This is the genealogy of Yeshua the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This speaks to us, to our people, about our Messiah. So once again, it was really funny because when I did my discussion with Dr. Michael Brown, he claimed that the house of David didn't necessarily refer to the Messiah, son of David, in certain contexts when I challenged him on Zechariah 12.10. But regardless of Dr. Brown's inconsistency there, um, that was in, in this uh, video here where I challenged him and debunked him on, live on his radio show. But regardless, this idea of Jesus being, you know, descended from David really shoots itself in the foot when you have this whole concept of the virgin birth because, of course, as we know, tribal heritage goes through the father biologically in the Tanakh. There's no exceptions to this. And Jesus would not fulfill the prophecy of even being of the lineage of the Messianic line if there was a virgin birth, right? And I've gone into detail about debunking this idea of Genesis 3.15, referring to this idea that the Messiah had to be born of a virgin, because we know in Isaiah 11, it says that, you know, the the serpent and the, uh, you know, the, the child will play together in the times of the future Messianic era in Isaiah chapter 11. That wasn't fulfilled in Jesus. So uh, you, you can't tell me that, you know, the curse of, you know, Eve and, and the serpent was, you know, overcome simply because Jesus existed and resurrected or whatever, which obviously I don't necessarily believe, but even if it did, it didn't it didn't fix anything. Sin still exists in the world. Snakes and children still fight, right? There's no fulfillment in this. It's a spiritual placebo. Everything that they claim about Isaiah 53, about the healing, about the the world peace, about the, you know, all of it has to be, you know, basically reinterpreted as some metaphorical concept that has no fulfillment. And if you, you know, there's to some degree, there can be beauty and metaphor, you know, a, a metaphor, but when every single thing you're using to have to, you know, explain away any sort of fulfillment, and then you say, oh, it's going to happen in the second coming. I mean, it's, it's absurd at this point. You can't defend it. There is not fulfillment of the Messianic prophecies regarding Jesus dying on a cross or having anything to do with Isaiah 53 or, you know, in, unless you want to include him among the righteous of, of, of Israel, I guess, in theory, if Jesus was so misunderstood and maybe, you know, in, in theory, if he was an, actually a righteous man who didn't, uh, you know, believe he was some sort of God man or whatever, look, Given the benefit of the doubt, maybe that's the case, but I can't trust the New Testament as far as I can throw it. So why, why should you? There's no reason to trust any of it. 
He didn't fulfill, like, from the first page of Matthew, like he's just saying, if there was a virgin birth, that would disqualify Jesus from being the Messiah in the first place. First page of Matthew. Anyway, if you want to look more in detail on Isaiah 7.14 and Matthew's contextual abuse of it, you can watch this video here. Anyway. I'm a Shiach. And so uh, I encourage you to uh, to check it out and read through it. And, and, you know, if you have any questions, you can also reach out to us and, and, and ask if you have any questions about it. But at least know what we're talking about and, and open your heart to God and, and invite him into your heart. Like, God, talk to me. Talk to me. If you're here and you saved me from dying and now we're here talking, are you trying to tell me something? You know what I mean? I think, uh, I think I do. Yeah. So check it out. Uh, I think you'll be uh, surprised at what you're going to find in here. And I'm happy to have, uh, have met you. So that's the appeal to the vulnerability of the situation. You know, you had a near-death experience, so why don't you try this instant gratification, you know, get out of jail free card. You are, All your sins are forgiven because Jesus died for your sins, even though there's no... There's no way to connect that to the Tanakh or any of what it teaches, but just trust me, bro. You know, like it, it, it doesn't uh, connect, right? You can contextually abuse Isaiah 53 all you want. Jesus didn't fulfill it, right? Jesus didn't fulfill any of what you're, you're claiming. So that's why you have to do this two comings nonsense because you realize, you, even you subconsciously recognize that he didn't fulfill it, so... Can I, um, Me too. <laughs> thank you. Can I pray for you? Sure. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just want to pray for uh, my, my new friend, uh, Sao. I thank you for saving his life and thank you for bringing us into this conversation. I just pray that you uh, continue to draw him closer to you and that you make yourself known to him in his heart and in his mind. Um, you tell us to study our faith so that it's not blind faith that we have an intellectual knowledge and an also a, a heart knowledge of who you really are. And so I just pray that you can uh, speak to my friend Sao here through your word and that you would bless him with the way that you blessed me and my colleague with uh, Yeshua HaMashiach and that it would change your life and that you would understand who he is and that you would devote your life to him and receive the, the free gift of forgiveness of sin and everlasting life with no pain and no suffering. And uh, so, yeah, you see, this is also a tactic that they use to pray on behalf of somebody, um, you know, and obviously interjecting that, you know, Avodah Zara of Jesus and Yeshu and all that sort of stuff. Like, what that does is it sort of creates this, you know, false illusion of comfort that, you know, this person is looking out for you and caring for you. And I, I'm sure there's some level of genuine, you know, concern. However, of course, the real push is to convince the person and plant these seeds of, you know, like falsehood in their minds that Jesus was the reason why they experienced, you know, whatever, quote unquote, you know, peace placebo, you know, basically it's a spiritual placebo. As I always say, Jesus is a spiritual placebo. So they will simply attribute this conversation later. It's it's sort of almost like a hypnotic suggestion <laughs> when you think about it of like, remember that conversation we had when we talked about death, you know? And remember that prayer that I gave you about Jesus? Like, it's, it's sort of like priming a malleable mind for, you know, having a sort of experience later, like... I'm sort of putting this together in my head how this works. And and that's really what they're doing. It's it's almost like, you know, uh, manipulation based on suggestion. I'm just glad you're safe. And I wish you and pray that you're fully healed, not only physically, but spiritually. And I lift these prayers in uh, B'Shem Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. Thank you. Oh, Yamach Shemo. I mean, it's just like, why? <laughs> just say the prayer. You don't have to say it in the name of your false god. Goodness sakes. Like, it's just, it's so cringe. Like, that's not how Abraham prayed. He didn't say in the name of your false messiah, your false god. No one said that. That's, the, pr the proof is in the pudding there. No one in the Tanakh ever said in the name of Yashka. No one. So why do you?
you. <laughs> Thank you. You're fighting for the future of Israel and the people of Israel. You're protecting us. And I thank you for that. And we're fighting for the souls of our people as well. Like we want our, we want the souls of our people to be in heaven. We want you to be in heaven with us. We want you to be reconnected with God and feel the joy and the love that he has for you. And, uh, and that's what this book offers you is, is it's God's love letter to you, showing you how much he loves you and that he doesn't want anybody to, to, to lose their soul. He doesn't want that to happen to anyone. Fear mongering, right? Because Christianity is based on the idea of, you know, this false dichotomy of if you believe in Jesus, then you go to heaven. If you don't, you go to hell. So that's, and once again, it's the false dichotomy even within the servant songs, right? It's like, well, you know, this, there's a righteous, sinless servant in, in Jesus, and then there's the sinful, bumbling, idiot, lying servant, which is everybody else, including, you know, Chas Vashalom, Isaiah, Right, in, in Jeremiah and everyone else is just a bunch of idiot lying sinners, right, in the Christian view, and they have no merit in any way, shape, or form because only Jesus is the only individual ever that had any sort of merit, right, which is silly, absolutely silly because the Tanakh doesn't, doesn't say that. Daniel was righteous. Moses was, you know, described as the greatest prophet of, of, of all time at the end of the Torah, right? You don't have to be sinless in order to be righteous, right? That's the idea of, of teshuva, right? And Christianity has completely, you know, taken this idea and made it into this false dichotomy regarding, you know, the servant, regarding sin, regarding all of these types of things. And, you know, messianic prophecy even, right? They don't know how to differentiate Prophecies that are exclusive to the Messiah, Son of David, and no one else, like Hosea 3 5, versus a prophecy like Isaiah 53, which is not exclusive to the Messiah, as we saw in Isaiah 49 3, where it explicitly says that the servant is Israel. And then they have to backpedal and redefine Israel as secret code word for Jesus. And it's just like, you have nothing. You have nothing. It's just, if you actually think logically about Christianity, it makes no sense. He wants all to come back to him. The Tanakh says, my people have a problem with me. They keep going off and worshiping idols and other gods. Yes, Jesus, another God, right? It says in Deuteronomy chapter 13, even if a prophet comes to you and the sign or wonder that he speaks happens and he says, let us go after other gods who you have not known and let us worship them. You shall not heed the words of that prophet or that dreamer of a dream for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you really love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. Well, guess what, Jeff Morgan? You have failed that test because God was testing you and you decided to follow the gods of other nations even if you claim that Jesus took you out of Egypt. The Tanakh doesn't claim that. The Tanakh doesn't say in the name of Jesus. You are praying to another God who Israel has not known. Abraham didn't know Jesus. Isaac didn't know Jesus. Jesus. Jacob didn't know Jesus. King David didn't know Jesus. Moses didn't know Jesus. Stop peddling a false narrative. Stop peddling a false Messiah and stop peddling a false God. I need to give a solution. Yeah. And so uh, if you read through a little bit of the Tanakh, the ending of the Tanakh, and you read that, you'll see a very smooth transition. I can uh, understand why. Because I'm, I know the story of Jesus. He believed in these things. Yeah. Do you know that uh, people that are watching this video are going to be praying for you? That's, uh, that's nice to know. They're going to be praying for everything about you. For you, for your family, for your health, and for your soul. So... That's what uh, people out there are going to be doing when they see this video. So just know that. And if you have any questions, you can, con you can contact me. Okay. All right? Sure. <laughs> Thanks, bro. And ask if you have any questions. About so he's right about one thing. People are going to be praying for him, right? Absolutely. So I want to pray for you, Sa'ar, right? I want to pray for you. I pray that you continue in the path of truth that you have learned in your studies when you were in school, when you learned the Tanakh unadulterated from the falsehoods and 
false teachings that this Jeff Morgan, Jews for Jesus idolater has been trying to poison your mind with. And that you see the Nisim in your life that you have been saved by Hashem. And, you know, when you were in the heat of battle and when you saw that you were able to be protected through Hashem, that you will acknowledge that Hashem is your creator, that Hashem is where the world exists, how the world exists, right? Through Hashem, no one else, not through Jesus, not through Yeshua, not through these false gods, whatever you want to call the New Testament deity that, you know, creates this confusion and falsehood that you will recognize, Sa'ar, that the Torah is true and that you can fulfill the mitzvot through your devotion to Torah and that you will share that light and be that or Lagoyim. Be that light to the nations. Be the, that servant that we are called to be, to be Israel, to be the servant of Isaiah 49, 3 through 6, who was also the servant of Isaiah 53, to be the or, or Lagoyim, the light to the nations through the following of the Torah, and that the nations will see the salvation of our God, the God of Israel, through our keeping of the Torah, and that we will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, as it says in Exodus 19. Not through Jesus, but through following God's Torah. May you merit salvation through the works of the Torah. Yes, people are praying for you, Sar. We thank you for all that you have done for Klau Yisrael. We pray for the salvation of Israel. We pray for the salvation of the world, right? As it says in Isaiah chapter 56 regarding the future in the Messianic times. I will bring them to my holy mount and I will cause them to rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be acceptable upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. May it happen speedily in our days. May the third temple be rebuilt, just as it is described here in Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7. And may we merit salvation. But not through the New Testament false God and false Messiah called Jesus, Yeshua, whatever you want to call him, but through the one true God of Israel, who Abraham prayed to, who Isaac prayed to, who Jacob prayed to. None of them prayed to Jesus. None of them prayed to Yeshua. They prayed to Hashem. They prayed to the one true God of Israel. I hope this video has been a blessing to you. Shalom Aleichem.